Hello, everyone. Feel free. We're going to take a minute just to fill out this little survey. You can scan this QR code. Anonymous responses will be populated on the screen. The question is, which of the following approaches do you think is the most effective in challenging our subconscious biases in the era of AI? We have number one, education and training. Two, diverse development teams. Three, public awareness campaigns. And four, inclusive data collection. Let's see those responses. I feel like I'm on a game show right now. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a few seconds. Whoa, how did it go down? <laughs> we showered today. Come on up. <laughs> oh, that's true, yeah. We took the chairs from the front row. We don't need them. <laughs> All right, looks like we've got a lot in. Was that? You want to sit here? This is my imaginary. I'm going to I'm going to eventually sit down. They're going to take some questions too. Okay. We've got a lot for uh, education and training. That seems like a big one. As a uh, I'll reread this for anybody who just came in. You can uh, scan this QR code, but which of the following approaches do you think is the most effective in challenging our subconscious biases in the era of AI? Education and training. That's a big one. Diverse development teams. We got three responses there. Public awareness campaigns. We got one there. And then inclusive data collection. Zero, zero uh, responses for that one so far. I need somebody to explain that to me. Why is there zero? Yeah. <laughs> You can rescan it and vote again, maybe. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But here's the thought. So subconscious bias makes you think, well, the human is involved, so that's the data collection. So that it's like, ah, oh, actually, somebody has to decide which data gets collected to use, and that is human, so that can have subconscious so bias. So that's the way you're presuming that all those things wow. are more and more done. Mm. Y'all failed. <laughs> you failed the test. This is not a test. You've scared everyone. Nobody wants to vote for that now. All right. Oh, how do I go back to, um, let me see. Center view. Sorry. How do I? Oh, I'm going to pres You're going to see it. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Sorry, I'm going to switch this over. Yeah, how do I do that again? Sally sells seashells. I seashells. <laughs> Testing the mics. I can't even find my mouse. That's fun. All right. Pull this back over. All right. Now we should be good. If I can find how to get it back. How do I get it on? How do I get that back to there? Should we start gossiping or something? Yeah. That's fun. Interesting. Why did the old person fall into the well? Did you click anything? Did you not show phone? They couldn't see that well. No. It was just there. <laughs> It was Sorry. right there, and now I, I can't it. get it back. All right, we'll just sit. What if we just unplug it and plug it back in? Okay. Start from the top. I'll just leave it. I'll just do it without it. You sure? Yeah. I got it. Okay. All right. Let's just get started. Technical issues, as always, but that's cool. 
Um, okay, so. Yeah, no, I know. That's fine. I'm going to pull them back up, but after I do my intros. All right. So we have four wonderful panelists with us today. We have Andy. Andy is a principal product designer and UX architect at Red Hat, supporting a variety of AI-related design initiatives across our portfolio. He has a master's degree in human factors engineering and a bachelor's engineering in engineering psychology, both from Tufts University, um, where he developed software to support engineering education in K-12, K through 12 schools, power infrastructure for maker spaces, and encourage practical learning by making physical and digital products. His hobbies and lifelong interests in making things to help people solve problems led him to the work um, of the intersection between technology and psychology as a designer in this wonderful tech industry. Uh, so like many of us here today, he's extremely interested in helping to ensure that AI's role in the next era of computing is safe and accessible and, um, and trustworthy. All right. Then we have Amber, our wonderful, wonderful Amber. Amber holds a dual master's certification in UX research and design from the University of Michigan um, and in other uh, and another in interaction design and UX management from the Nielsen Norman Group. Her undergrad focus was in psychology and ethics applied to technology, so really great for speaking about AI, <laughs> which made her especially curious in how AI would be used in user research um, and also in the tech that we build at Red Hat, also a Red Hat, uh, Red Hat um, employee. She recently completed a course of study in ethics and AI and data science through the Linux Foundation, and before joining Red Hat, worked in healthcare software for 15 years, so working um, in emergent applications of natural language processing and machine learning models for clinical decision making. Um, and then Amber currently supports researchers um, and the design and research, research operations team as a manager at Red Hat. Um, Amber will have to sneak out a few minutes early to catch a flight back home. Um, so we super appreciate her being here and sending all the positive vibes that she makes her flight. Okay. <laughs> then we have Yahav. Yahav is currently going to um, be a senior at Tufts University, uh, is pursuing a bachelor's in human factors engineering, and is also minoring um, in engineering management. Has entered at Red Hat for the past two summers, which we've loved having her and has become more passionate about user research, AI, and the intersection between those two, um, especially over this past summer while working on plenty of AI products at Red Hat. And she has completed a UX, while also interning, has completed a UX design certificate course through Google's Coursera, and has also completed several multiple LinkedIn courses touching on LLMs, AI essentials, and UX um, for UXers and more. Um, she also, check it out, has a blog on Medium where she posts about new ways to use AI in UXD related roles and how to address the biases in user research. And last but not least, we have Maureen, who is the manager of RHEL AI, an Instruct Lab engineering team at Red Hat, currently working on building open communities around AI and creating tooling to enable the democratization of AI model creation, which was a um, a good topic for that day zero um, uh, event as well. Uh, a recipient of the O'Reilly Open Source Award, uh, Maureen also has over 20 years of experience as a UX engineer and designer working in upstream free uh, libre open source software communities. Um, and an open source portfolio is wide ranging from um, OS management tools, OS infra UIs to the cloud-based medical image processing project Chris, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, to the developer-oriented Podman desktop, to the open source uh, Instruct Lab, which we all saw at the booth today, um, and AI, which is an AI modeling tuning um, platform. She has an MS in human-computer interaction and a bachelor's in computer science from Rensselaer Polytech Institute. So let's give a round of applause for all of our. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get started. I tried to plug it in. See, we, I tried to give it one more shot. Oh! Nope, still not going to work for us. All right. I'm just going to stand back here then. 
All right, so part one, context and examples. So my first question for our panelists is, can you provide real world examples where ethical considerations have significantly shaped the user experience or AI implementation? And are there any lessons learned? Uh, let's see, Andy, do you want to start us off? Sure, so I think we have a couple of examples that Emery would cover. Um, one is from back in 2020 or so, you folks remember that, beginning of COVID and such. Uh, there's a consortium of companies from Microsoft, Amazon, um, and IBM as well actually, who signed sort of like a pact to not sell uh, predictive sort of policing software to police departments in recognition that they're heavily biased in many different ways. Um, that was one example where external pressures from uh, organizations like the ACLU, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, as well as internal employee pressures kind of pushed them to not sell the technology before it was actually ready and could cause, um, you know, lead to bad impact, uh, bad outcomes for humanity and our society, the American society at least, um, before the technology is quite ready in that case. So that's sort of one example where, you know, sort of recognition that AI systems and predictive uh, models were not quite ready at that time, probably still aren't quite ready um, to do that kind of kind of thing. Um, until appropriate regulations were put into place as well. That's sort of their stipulation that maybe we get there someday, but without the actual legal system fully caught up to where the technology is, they weren't comfortable actually selling that technology to police departments. So there's one example of that back in 2020. Um, another example of generative AI, actually before even ChatGPT and the current zeitgeist there, folks remember back in 2016 or so, does my, uh, Microsoft Tay ring any bells at all? <laughs> Tay, no, yes, that was weird, yes, no? <laughs> Um, that was a Twitter bot, and it was back when it was still called Twitter. Uh, it was a generative AI sort of platform or chatbot-like thing um, that people could tweet at and sort of give feedback to or, or chat with casually. Uh, it was an experiment run by Microsoft just to see kind of what would happen if they opened up a chatbot to the entire world and had people feed it comments and sort of discuss things with it. It very quickly became uh, a very toxic AI human humanoid robot thing. Um, that's feedback sort of vile filth and uh, I don't think that experiment quite went to according to plan in that case. Um, it was just an experiment to see what would happen, kind of introducing that technology and that sort of backfired as well. Um, those are sort of two examples. And I think even, I don't know, this isn't a real example necessarily, but how many of you folks watch Black Mirror at all, or the Netflix series Black Mirror? They get into a lot of AI topics, and that's not just the things that are realistic or like things that are um, uh, in implemented states today, but quite a few of the episodes kind of touch on AI-related topics and what would happen if um, sort of AI assistance or, or certain capabilities empowered by AI like perfect memory, for example, uh, were to actually become technologically possible, what might happen in the current state of humanity if that technology were available? It's kind of interesting to look back at even episodes from many, many years ago, um, some of the earliest ones on these topics and seeing some of those aren't so unrealistic anymore. Um, sort of they're good examples seeing where humanity might go uh, if some of this technology is unchecked. So those are a few kind of examples from years past. Can you a few more remember, I think? Yeah, thanks for being Andy Downer there. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> Let's talk some positive so ones. I will um, say that this is a very important topic because it's not a question of whether AI is going to change the world that we live in, but whether we can leverage it to change it for the better. And so uh, there are some really exciting examples that I'm seeing. Google is working on something called Euphonia. Uh, so they recognized a need in humans that may not have the standard speech patterns, people with ALS, people who have survived a stroke, people with Down syndrome. And they recognized a gap where text-to-speech technology and voice recognition technology like Siri and Alexa are not understanding them. And so they're actually getting a lot more diverse sampling of voices so that it can allow these people to also benefit from that tech. And of course, um, a lot of you have probably heard about how AI is really excellent for just looking at and generating ideas of how existing medications might be applied in novel ways. And it's actually finding some things that human researchers didn't find, and, and they're testing that out. Uh, so there are a lot of ethical implications on the data that we collect about the patients as well, uh, such as their, their race and their gender and ethnicity, that a lot of times we question, should we be capturing that? And it's a real, that's the sticky wicket, but also how can we be figuring out these like applied medicines? How can we figure out this will work better for these people unless we are capturing that segmenting criteria? 
So that's, I don't have the answer. That's like my open question right now on AI, is, is how, much the, how much is too much and, and just enough to learn about people. Yeah, that's great. Do you have anything you want to add, Mel? So two things to consider real world examples. I am a parent of a child with a rare condition. When you have a rare condition, there's not actually a lot of data to do things like use AI to uh, process radiological images, something that the CRISP project can do, um, and find discoveries like what are ways we can diagnose this condition quicker, what are ways that we can assess better treatments. When there's not a lot of people in the world with the condition, like just the MRI image with all metadata stripped can actually be personally identifying. So there's no answer, right? It really depends if you want to submit your data or not to be used to help other people in the world. But I think that's one real world thing that has to be thought through. Like even just stripping the metadata and using that to train just the images alone can impart a lot of personally identifying information. Um, so that has to be a consideration. Um, another thing which is sort of a strange, it, it is, I believe, an ethical consideration. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with like DNA ge genealogy. And so like I know Ancestry and some other companies that do DNA are now, of course, looking at using AI to find patterns and to find relationships. And in some cases, maybe those relationships weren't meant to be found or they cause awkward <laughs> situations for families. Like, oh, by the way, you have a brother you didn't know about or those sorts of things. They can be very impactful on a person's life. I'm on the side also where I do a lot of research for my family and I get into the weeds of like going through very old documents from like the 1800s or the 1700s trying to figure out just like there's no OCR for scripting except now when they released the 1950 US census so every 10 years they'll release the census from the equivalent I think it's 70 years I'm not doing the math in my head right now but um, you know, when they did the 1940, it was sort of a crowdsourced effort of transcribing it. When they did the 1950, I think the, it was available in like a month for searchable because they used AI OCR. Mm. So, um, but the thing is too, when you have all these like old documents, like do you think the person back in 1870 really thought that somebody in 2024 was going to know that, I'll tell you a story about my, my great grandfather. He apparently had a, uh, a buggy he was going to the market with, I don't know, probably produce or animals or something. And he got pulled over because he didn't have the lantern. You know, like his headlight was out, except it was a buggy and a horse, and he didn't have the lantern. <laughs> and now here I am, oh man, my uncle, or my, my great grandfather, he was a criminal. He, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, I think those are ethical considerations too, is sort of the right to be forgotten. And these records mm. are sitting somewhere, and now. AI can process them at such a speed and make connections between them across databases and across data sets. It's a little terrifying. Yeah, super interesting. I feel like it could compromise our privacy to an, ex to an extent. So as you can see, there's a lot of positive but potentially negative experiences and things that can come from AI. Um, so how do we handle that? So <clears throat> how might we challenge and minimize our biases as UX research researchers or people who do research? Um, so in what ways can we validate our research findings to avoid confirmation bias? Confirmation bias, for those of you who don't um, already know, confirmation bias is um, when you kind of, you're doing research and you're kind of like looking for something to support your biases or something that you already feel or, or um, are comfortable with. So it's, you're looking to confirm something that you already um, know or feel. Um, and then how can we use peer reviews to identify biases in our research methods and findings? And peer reviews, um, just another term just to, for definition purposes, peer reviews are um, when you have a, uh, a group of academically appropriate people um, review your data in order to make sure that you have other individuals um, reviewing as a peer review. Um, all right, let's see. Amber, did you want to pick this one up? Here you go. So I'll start really broad and then probably let Yahav get more specific with it. I think that one thing that we need to do is be careful not to think of bias as a bad word, that, we, mm -hmm. that it makes us a bad person to admit that we have a bias in the first place. Our brains are natural story-making machines, and it has a lot of 
value in a situation where if something hisses or growls at you, you instinctively back away. So we very quickly jump to explanations and reactions to things. And so one of the best defenses for ourselves in, as individuals, not just talking about AI alone, is to acknowledge that bias exists and actually seek out and ask for opinions. Um, and, and one example is that I asked several of my colleagues before this panel to just take a look at the questions and answers, because they're very uh, focused on the ethical application of AI right now. And they pointed out to me that it was interesting that, yes, there were a lot of females on the panel, but there were no people of color. And I immediately typed, well, I think this was at the last minute, and it was people that were going to be in Boston. And then like an hour later, I was like, you know, I have to apologize that I actually just defended anything. I appreciate you pointing it out to me. And so that's how we stop confirmation bias is by acknowledging that it doesn't make you a, a bad person to have a presumption and it definitely is something to thank people for when they point it out. Um, and then also in our research, obviously going back to fifth grade science class, have a hypothesis based on observation but then set things up not to prove your hypothesis but so that they could actually disprove it. Um, Set out with a question and make sure that you can get a, a, a negative or a, a disproven answer as well. Yeah, that was great. I also wanted to talk a little bit about how we can use um, kind of those peer reviews in more user research specific cases. So typically right now in like the research process, what we do after we have done whatever research we've done, we typically go back to the stakeholders. We have some sort of research readout with them. Sometimes we ask them to do some sort of survey to give feedback on our research process. But something that could be really beneficial when it comes to identifying biases in our research is almost having this additional retro where we're taking a look at you know, a structured reflection session. And I'll start off by saying how we can use AI to do that. You know, We can give AI um, either the, the results of our research, obviously uh, no PII involved, and, and we can ask it, you know, where do you think you can identify some of these points where we may be falling into biases, you know, falling into um, like focusing on these stereotypes without us even knowing. Um, and then we can actually get together as a group, um, as the researchers have this sort of reflection, bias reflection retro, let's say, um, could be the name of it, and then get together, talk about these assumptions that were either validated or not validated in our research, and where we can identify those points where bias might have, you know, kind of creeped in, uh, though you're right, it's not, we don't have to look at it in a bad way. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that idea of kind of having a retro on the research that we just recently performed. I think that's a great idea. All right, so let's think about how can we really challenge and minimize our biases as it relates to the actual product design process. So. What are the ethical considerations that should be kept in mind when designing AI? And then what steps can be taken to ensure AI models are trained on diverse and representative data sets? This kind of brings us back to the initial question on the screen, the Mentimeter uh, survey question, is like, how do we get that representative data set? Um, let's see. Uh, Mo, do you want to start us off here? So in terms of the ethical considerations when designing AI, like designing AI itself or like designing a thing or system that uses AI? Mm. A system or a thing that uses AI okay. for the first one. Okay. Yeah. So I think you need to have some literacy around AI and how it works if you're designing mm -hmm. something that incorporates AI. So for example, be aware of what are the models you are selecting to work with? How, how were they trained? If you have any information about the pre-training data sets or anything about the tuning data sets, those are things you're going to want to consider. I will give an example, and this is not generative AI, it's a it's a predictive AI example, but like for, for a medical, I'll bring it back to medical conditions, something I'm familiar with. Um, different medical conditions can appear in different populations because they may be environmentally linked or genetically mm -hmm. linked within populations that have a shared genetic pool. So you might have a certain condition that's more likely to be in one population based on location than another. And if you have a model that is trained on data from, let's say, upper middle class people from California, might not be finding all the things it should be finding for a population, say, in Asia or Europe, 
that doesn't have the same environmental factors or the same genetic factors at play. So you want to be very conscious of things like that, like what is the, what is the diversity of this data set? How is it going to apply to the target users? Because that's going to impact the results they get. Um, a very simplistic example of this in action, I don't actually know that it was AI, but it, it, it gives the point anyway, is that when you go to like a public restroom where it has the automatic sink, mm -hmm. sometimes based on your skin color, you may not get water. And that kind of sucks. And that means that however that was built, it was built for a specific population without other populations in mind, but it impacts all. So it's one of those things that just consider, know enough about the technology that you're incorporating in your design to understand its impact in the real world on the people and the population mm -hmm. that will actually be using it. The second thing is what steps can be taken to ensure AI models are trained on diverse and representative data sets. So like, it's all about the data sets. That's why I was a little dismayed that that one thing on the vote got zero. <laughs> um, but also, I think a big part of this, and of course, this is my, sh my spiel, is democratizing AI. Part of democratizing AI means that not just a few um, richly resourced companies who, let's say, just coincidentally have access to very large data sets about very large populations um, are the ones that are pre-training models and that that pre-training data is a black box. I think that if, if society is going to be served by this technology, then society needs to have an opportunity to actually impact it um, mm -hmm. and have some control over it. So I think when we look at democratizing AI in terms of the technology used to build it, um, the data sets that are put into it, um, the models and the licensing involved so that anybody could get involved, lowering the barrier to entry to working with AI so that you don't need unobtainium GPUs that cost more money than I have to actually access and run. Um, so I think that is sort of a democratization is a good solution to that issue. Yeah, that's a great point. I love the point about like how we're growing accessibility, uh, how we're growing it, the, um, the data sets is through accessibility. So how do we make this more accessible to diverse population, that's the way, that's probably the way to grow our data sets. And this drift over time too, because mm -hmm. population shift. Yeah, that's a great point. Andy, you want to add? When it comes to like, you know, adding AI capabilities and features to our applications and services, we're at DevConf, I know a lot of us are actually developers building things inside of our companies. One thing that really worries me is the Silicon Valley mindset of moving past and break things, as you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg said in the past. In the case of AI and these features, like we're building new capabilities and features that we've never explored yet. Uh, we don't know what we can build necessarily with these mm -hmm. things. There's a potential that we can move fast and really hurt people and really hurt society and build features and capabilities that we probably should not have. Um, so in the case of like predictive policing I was mentioning earlier, like when you get a sense in your own companies and the things you're working on that this could be used inappropriately, this could actually like, like really hurt people, um, I think in, in some, we need to be empowered to say no in some cases or raise a flag and say, I don't want to work on this feature. I don't want to ship this thing. We need to stop and think about what we're doing, do some deliberate testing, make sure that this is actually accurate and that this won't actually hurt people. Um, I don't know, as an example, like imagine WebMD, but it's a chatbot or something and tells everyone they have cancer or I don't know, are they going to die next week? Um, I worry about things like that where we just cram AI powered features and capabilities using various data sets and then retroactively realize like, oh, People died because of this potentially, or or this caused negative outcomes. Um, the law is not cut up to this whole category of of capabilities quite yet. We don't really know what new dark patterns might emerge, what new behaviors we might encourage with this technology. So, I'd kind of encourage us all to move deliberately, uh, be careful as we're making these new, new capabilities and new things, um, mm -hmm. and try and get out of that Silicon Valley mindset at least a little bit, despite all the external pressures to add AI features and capabilities to everything we're doing. Um, that's what kind of keeps me up at night is like we might discover <laughs> that whoops, whoopsie daisies, uh, someone got hurt from this. Um, even two days ago, for example, and this is a, a slight stretch, but um, there was a research lab I think in Tokyo that was working on agentic systems with AI. Agentic meaning it can also uh, have the ability to change itself and manipulate its own code and things and potentially connect to external networks. Um, they found that they constrained the model and this AI model to do a particular task, to do some, I forget the exact particulars. Um, uh, run a bunch of experiments on medical data, I believe, within a certain time frame, and the model changed or tweaked the parameters of its code and its sort of guardrails so that it could extend the amount of time it had to work on a problem. Um, it's like it's changing and evolving in that way, 
And I worry about, all right, what if that thing had a network connection to the outside world or something? It were to decide to interact with external systems in some way to manipulate its parameters and, and continue working on tasks or pursue an outcome um, and potentially take danger ac dangerous actions to do so. Uh, you know, I'm you know, the negative Debbie Downer in this group, I guess. But <laughs> uh, uh, if that happens, that's a, that's a whoopsie daisy that can really hurt people potentially. And as we're experimenting and playing these things, I think we have to do so responsibly as well. Um, yeah. That's a great point. I, and I also really like the point that you made about like, what the, what can we ignore? Like, right, there's this whole idea of like, AI can solve everything, AI can solve everything, but does it have to, you know? Can't we just say that some of these problems are already being solved today and let's focus on other areas where we can solution where AI can really be impactful um, in society in a positive, in a positive way. <laughs> I just wanna make a quick counter to Debbie Downer. Um, <laughs> You, you can do a lot of harm without AI and with computing and automation and, you know, yeah. just saying, true, true. just saying. <laughs> All right, moving on. How might we introduce uh, inclusivity measures as UX designers and researchers? Um, so how can we really foster collaboration kind of between AI researchers, developers, and communities in order to create solutions to really mitigate our biases? Uh, so again, I'm going to talk from a broad perspective that when we are collaborating with a group of people, it has been proven time over time that the more people you're working with, you get a more diffuse sense of responsibility. Mm. Oh, that person is going to be the one to raise the red flag. Oh, that person is really the one that's going to be responsible for this. And so I think the first thing is for everyone who is collaborating to agree that they have individual accountability. And then... Uh, Andy alluded to this, having a predefined channel, instead of waiting for the whoopsie daisy, actually say, these are some of the types of things to watch for, and this is the way to communicate it, and then actually commend or express gratitude when people do raise a red flag, even if it turns out to not be a, to be a non-issue, really show in everything that you do that you want people to raise those when they come up. And again, I will take that more specific UX <laughs> research approach. Um, bye, Amber. Bye. bye. Good, luck. <laughs> Good luck. You're going to make the flight. Have a safe flight. OK. <laughs> um, great. So basically, when it comes to introducing those inclusivity measures, specifically in U UX research, um, something that we, at least on the team, are very passionate about is taking a look at you know all of our potential users. right? And that was discussed in the talk before this. Um, something that I'm very passionate about is taking a look at those edge case users. So those are typically the users that you don't see as like being um, the majority, let's say, of who might end up using your product. And the way that we can actually account and include these users in our total research process is by creating these personas that were introduced before, um, creating multiple versions of them. Okay, so personas, if you weren't here for the talk before, is like a representation um, or an archetype of who our potential users could be. And you know something that we could do specifically at a tech company is create different personas, let's say, based on different um, technical expertise. So you can have one persona that's like, you know, knows um, everything about, let's say, OpenShift, and you have another one who's like basically never heard of it. And by creating these personas, we actually promote a sense of empathy on the UX research team um, because we actually get to know our people better. And <laughs> and uh, and yeah, and that that's just one way that we are very passionate about. Promoting that inclusivity is by creating a bunch of different kinds of personas that come from different backgrounds, not necessarily just, uh, you know, let's say socioeconomic status, but in a, in a tech field, it could be something like, you know, technical expertise um, or maybe even comfort to explore a new product um, and, and things like that. So that's also another way we could promote inclu inclusivity. I love yeah. it. I'm glad that we closed on how we can collaborate and continue to work towards creating a more ethical environment when it comes to AI and user research. So I think that's all we have for today. So thank you, everyone. And thank you. Give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>